Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a long time since I've been able to have the pleasure of introducing someone on one of these Zoom chats. I'm Beth Dominiani, the library director. I suspect I know everybody, but just in case. Well, we have a wonderful program for you this evening. And let's get started. To research their recently published book, Genesis Americanus, a 70-year-old Northwestern, 70-year-old or so, I guess, Northwestern journalism professor, Lauren Gillionet, and two 20-something Northwestern journalism students, Alyssa Karras and Dan Tham, climbed into a minivan and embarked on a three-month, 28-state, 14,063-mile road trip in search of America's identity. After interviewing 150 Americans about contemporary identity issues, they wrote a book, which is a part of an oral history, part shoe leather reporting, part search for America's future, part memoir, and part travel journal. On their journey, they retraced Mark Twain's travels across America, from Hannibal, Missouri, to Chicago, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, New Orleans, Salt Lake City, San Francisco, and Seattle. They hope that Twain's insights into the late 19th century soul of America would help them understand America of today and the ways that our cultural fabric has shifted. Their interviews focused on issues of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and immigration status. What they learned along the way paints an emerging portrait of the country during this crucial moment of our time and political upheaval. One of their stops along the way, as they retraced Twain's footsteps, was right here in Reading. The late Heather Morgan and I were delighted to share treasures from the library's archives and guide them along what we all finally in Reading call the Reading Twain Trail. Today, I'm very delighted that two of the trio are able to join us. The distinguished journalist Lauren Gillionet is a veteran of a half century in journalism, journalism education, and as professor of emeritus of journalism at Northwestern University. He owned and edited the Southbridge, Massachusetts Evening News and ran that parent company for 26 years. He served as a four time Pulitzer Prize juror, juror excuse me, a guest curator of a 1990 Library of Congress exhibit and president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors. He's the author or editor of nine books. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. As president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, he created a groundbreaking disabilities committee and initiated a landmark study of gays and lesbians in US newsrooms. Then a student when he saw us in Reading, Dan Tham is now a producer for CNN's Global Features team based in Hong Kong. He's responsible for producing premium original programming for TV, digital and social platforms. His work ranges from travel to business to social justice media. Dan joined CNN in 2013. He was previously based at the network's Atlanta headquarters, where he helped produce long form features with their documentary unit. Of course, he holds his undergraduate degree in broadcast journalism from Northwestern University. Before we uh, go on to our speakers, I would like to extend a thank you to the Reading League of Women Voters, our co-sponsor of the Conversations on Race series and to the Mark Twain Foundation for their generous support of the library's Twain in Reading programming. Please sit back, get comfortable and enjoy a wonderful presentation. It's a great pleasure to again, welcome both of these gentlemen back to Reading. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you Beth for your generous introduction and for having us back to the Mark Twain Library. It's really an honor. Gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson wrote, old Americans go out on the highway and drive themselves to death. But our 14,000 mile drive around America, which loosely followed as you indicated the path of Mark Twain, was for me a drive to live, to take a pulse of America, 
to do some roots research about the Gilliones, family or non-family, to experience the education of the open road, to interview people I'd never met, and friends from decades earlier about race, sexual orientation, and other hot button identity issues. Twain wrote, there ain't no surer way to find out whether you like people or hate them than to travel with them. I really liked my traveling companions, Alyssa Karras and Dan Tham, and I'm sorry Alyssa can't join us this evening. Uh, she graduated from the journalism school and had rejected immediately pursuing a prestigious journalism job, the normal goal of journalism students, to work 70 to 80 hours a week as our trips well below minimum wage everything, navigator, travel agent, copy editor, tech specialist, photographer, and Advil dispenser. I soon experienced the merry mischievous side of Alyssa, whose motto is, everything is a good time or a good story. Halfway from Evans to Hannibal, Missouri, our first night's destination, Alyssa and I stopped at the Cahokia Mounds State Historic Site in Collinsville, Illinois. The museum's information center insisted that Alyssa and I wear laminated writing permit badges on strings around our necks. I thought of a character in, Nash, uh, in a Na Nathaniel Hawthorne novel, the bearer of an illegit illegitimate child who was required to wear a scarlet ape or adulteress on her dress. At the end of our Cahokia visit, I grumbled to a staff person about the writing permit requirement as I returned my laminated badge. Alyssa did me one better. She stole hers. Dan, uh, who is fortunately with, for us with us this evening, uh, was a junior and he was taking the trip as a one credit course. And he was uh, joining Alyssa and me two days after our beginning the Odyssey, returning from internships in India and Germany that reflected his interest in reporting on the world's outliers. Credit is upbringing. He recalled his time in white bread, heavily Mormon Salt Lake City as a quadruple minority, Asian, gay, Buddhist, and vegetarian. While Dan achieved in the way most journalism students wanted to achieve, as a senior, he would win Northwestern's top broadcast journalism award. He also explored what it means to be an outlier. He was the first man to live with a woman in Northwestern's inaugural gender neutral housing for a course on Chicago's immigrant and multi-ethnic communities he reported on Koreans and Tibetans, at one point finding himself in the middle of a protest for Tibetan freedom outside the Chinese embassy. Uh, Beth, you indicated that we interviewed 150 Americans. While I interviewed most of them, I invited Alyssa and Dan to interview people of special interest to them. So tonight, in the limited time we have, we're gonna try to do two things. Uh, introduce some of the people uh, in, in the book so you get a sense of uh, the diversity of the Americans we talked with. And then uh, just have an exchange of, of uh, our uh, reflections on the trip and what was the most important to us, what astonished us, what disappointed us and so on. Uh, I conducted the trip's first interview at the Mark Twain Birthplace Museum in Stoutsville, Missouri with 61 year old museum guide, Connie Ritter. She recalled as a child never entering the museum. Quote, no one ever told us we couldn't go inside, she said, but we knew we couldn't go inside and now I work here. She said that at the beginning, Mark Twain wasn't my cup of tea. I hated Mark Twain because of Nigger Jim. She questioned Twain's use of the African-American character in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. It took me a while to understand what I understand about Huck Finn now. Ritter considers the novel and assault on racism. Ritter used her position at the museum to highlight the role of slavery in the area, nicknamed Little Dixie. The area had a disproportionately large number of plantations, slaves, and lynchings. In 2010, she added a slavery display to the museum's exhibit. The display showed a reproduction ball and chain, a foot wide, seven three quarter pound ball attached by a short chain to a slave's ankle that demonstrated how hard it would have been for a slave to escape. When I returned to the museum in 2015, and I should add that traveling on a trip like this, when you only have an hour or so to interview somebody, realizes you really have to retravel America 
to learn more about the people you interviewed and also to interview other people to fill in holes in the story. Anyway, I, when I visited in 2015, I learned Ritter had retired in December 2014. The museum no longer employed any African Americans. Her slavery display had been taken down, supposedly only for as long as it would take to get proper permission to use the photos in the display. But in late 2017, three years after Ritter's retirement, the slavery display remained in the museum's basement. Marianne Bodine, an interpretive research specialist, talked about renovating the museum's exhibits as a 10-year project. If the museum displayed a slavery exhibit, she said, it would be down the line a bit, not anytime soon. I telephoned Ritter at her home. She hoped the slavery display would return. I received so much positive feedback, she said. The exhibit's removal seemed to foreshadow in the time of Trump regression on race. The trip may sound romantic with all of this Mark Twain and, and so on, um, but I thought I'd ask uh, Dan if he could talk about not only the romance of it, you know, or being on the Mississippi River in a riverboat and all of that, but also the daily routine and uh, his visit to a hospital in Nashville. Before I, he answers, I just wanted you to see this map of, uh, of the United States, and you can see how uh, we, we wound our way around the United States. You know, it only takes 3,000 miles to go directly across, but it took us 14,000 miles because we insisted on following Mark Twain's pass, path as first as a printer's devil going to New York City and Philadelphia. Then he became a railroad pilot and went down to New Orleans regularly on a route from St. Louis to New Orleans. And then out west, where he was a reporter uh, when he failed at prospecting in uh, Nevada Territory and, and San Francisco. And then we included Seattle because when he been, went bankrupt and later in his life, he started a year, world round trip uh, to get solvent from uh, S Seattle. That was the last place in the United States before going to India and South Africa and so on. So Dan, any thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for, for joining this evening. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to be here uh, with Lauren to talk about our trip from all these years ago. Um, you know, of course, you know, road trips are, are a very kind of mythologized thing in, in kind of American life. And so, it, it, you know, on the whole, it was a very beautiful way to see the country. Um, but of course, there, it, we, it had its moments as well. You know, you get fatigued driving through um, certain states that are, you know, kind of the, the landscape doesn't shift very much. Um, but I think we did a very good job of making sure that everyone kind of, you know, drove more or less equally while one person drove, the other two would sleep in the back. And um, I remember stopping at um, lots of really special restaurants that are kind of like local specialties in the various places we went, um, particularly uh, I'd call out Doe's Eat Place in Greenville, Mississippi, Red Rooster in Harlem. Um, you know, a lot of these places that Lauren had visited in his past that he wanted to introduce us to. So that was really a treat. Um, but, you know, being on the road for three months, um, you know, we were staying at, you know, the cheapest motels possible in order to kind of maximize our budget. And I remember in, um, it was in, uh, was in Nash it was in Nashville, Tennessee, um, the motel was really creepy. I slept with the light on and I think it ended up giving me a really bad headache when I woke up. So um, I ended up having to go to the hospital and we lost an entire day of work um, because of this horrific migraine that I got because I was too afraid of sleeping at night. So there were some mishaps like that on the, on the way, but I have to say on the whole, it was really smooth. Thanks, Dan. Um, we also, uh, I, I wanted to introduce you to uh, uh, Michael Gaines, who grew up on a farm near Bethel, Missouri. Uh, he, he was the only openly uh, gay man in Hannibal that uh, we were told about. And so we went to talk to him. He runs the uh, Hannibal Arts Council. Um, and uh, he, he reassured us that there was really, you know, nothing difficult about living in the town. He was accepted despite uh, we had seen a Facebook, uh, an incident where the local 
uh, Baptist affiliated college had uh, refused to readmit a student uh, who had uh, announced on uh, uh, Facebook that he was uh, gay. Um, so uh, Gaines told us a story about uh, returning to uh, uh, his hometown of Bethel, Missouri, three or four times a year to play the piano at the Bethel Christian Church, his church since junior high. It was as much my family as my family was, he said. When church elders learned he and his partner had been living together, they took Gaines aside and told him he never again would be allowed to be part of the worship team and play the piano during services. But he joined the Bowling Green Disciples of Christ Church and welcomed his piano playing during services. The church I grew up might change their attitude or they may not, but it is really not of my concern now, Gaines said. Moving on. He talked optimistically about cultural changes. Sometimes they take a while to trickle down to small town America, he said, but he remained committed to Hannibal. I feel loved and appreciated for who I am and for the work I do. That's pretty good for anyone. He mentioned a young man who came up to him at a party and told him how much he valued Gaines being himself in the community. My doing that made a real difference to some of his gay friends in high school, Gaines said made my day. The trade-off for me to move to a bigger city would be that I would actually lose a part of myself, something that most people might say I lose by staying here. Um, we went to Chicago uh, after going through St. Louis, and uh, I just recall uh, Barbara Zeman, uh, after we had visited a deacon Gilioni, you know, we were looking for Gilionis everywhere, and he had that very strongly talked about um, the position of the church on uh, Catholic church on uh, LGBT gay community. And uh, I guess from, uh, the Pope is changing that policy I, I was hearing today on the radio, uh, but also on uh, women priests, that there would never be women priests. So uh, we attended in Chicago, the 40th anniversary mass of Dignity Chicago, a congregation that served LGBTQ Catholics. Barbara Zeman, here pictured, led 55 Dignity Chicago congregants in singing, for everyone born a place at the table, to live without fear and simply to be. Later, the 64-year-old Zeman described her path to becoming a priest, which began with a traditional Catholic upbringing. She attended Catholic schools, Catholic university. She felt a call to the priesthood. The Second Vatican Council suggested anything might be possible. She thought the church soon might open the doors to women leaders and allow lay people to take ownership of our church, she said, but that failed to happen. In 1998, still seeking answers about the place of women in the church, she earned a master's in theology. And uh, in 2002, she learned that male bishops in Europe were ordaining women as priests, but they were doing so in secret, she said, because if their identities became known, they would be removed from their duties and put under house arrest by the Vatican. In 2008, the Vatican decreed excommunication for any woman, woman who sought ordination. Nevertheless, that year, a female bishop from Roman Catholic women priests, an organization not sanctioned by the Catholic Church, ordained Zeman in Chicago. Hundreds of women, Catholic women, have been similarly ordained worldwide since then. And in response, in 2010, the Vatican categorized ordinations of women as serious a crime as priest sexual abuse of children. I'm going to be who I am, Zeman said. In 2018, 60% of US Catholics felt women should be permitted to be priests, but Zeman doubted the Catholic Church would change its position on the role of women priests. Quote, well, these guys are playing hardball. It's about power, not about Jesus. So um, while I was interviewing all these Gilionis along the way, Deacon Gilioni being the, the most recent, and other Italian Americans, beginning in Chicago, Dan started introducing us to Vietnamese Americans. And I'm curious, Dan, um, what similarities and differences struck you about their experiences, these two different uh, immigrant groups? Um, sure, I was really inspired by your um, obsession, I guess, with meeting every Gilione that lived in the United States. So, um, you know, I think early on in the trip, 
I suggested that it would be great if we also spoke to some Vietnamese Americans and to find out what their, <clears throat> excuse me, what their experience was in this country. You know, I'm, I'm uh, the son of refugees as well from, from Vietnam. So I've always had kind of a curiosity about that history. Um, I think as far as similarities, there's, there's some very superficial ones, um, you know, uh, tight knit families and an obsession for food, that kind of thing. But also, uh, you know, I noticed kind of a attention that I think is kind of universal to the to the immigrant experience um, of, of the first generation arrivals trying their best to kind of integrate to assimilate into American society and to, you know, for all intents and purposes, kind of shirk their, their past and, and kind of fit in. But then in subsequent generations, um, I think embodied by by you and me, Lauren, um, there was a curiosity for roots research um, to try to understand, um, you know, your ancestry and, and where you came from. So I'm happy that we both kind of fit into the latter camp. Um, as far as differences are concerned, um, I think it's just kind of a matter of you know, the amount of time that we spent in the US, uh, the Vietnamese arrived in the 70s and 80s for the, for the most part. Um, and so the kind of shared history with the US is, is, uh, is fairly short. Whereas your great grandfather arrived from Italy in 1872. So about a hundred years before, you know, my family did. Um, and so you, you do notice that with the Gilliones that we met around the country, um, they had basically fully integrated into American life culturally and linguistically and 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 in many in, in many ways. Whereas I think for the Vietnamese in the U.S., it's still an ongoing process. Um, but your question does remind me of um, a quote from Viet Thanh Nguyen, who's the uh, the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for his 2015 novel *The Sympathizer*. Um, he wrote about the Vietnamese refugees. We were not a people who charged into war at the beck and call of bugle or trumpet. No, we fought to the tune of love songs, for we, the, for we were the Italians of Asia. So I thought that was a kind of a nice tie-in between our two ideas. <laughs> well, that's wonderful, Dan. Um, so as a gay man, do you think you experienced, you experienced our visit to, uh, we visited this home of Dr. Larry Mass in uh, New York City. And uh, I knew him because he was one of the first, if not the first, person who reported on HIV AIDS uh, long before people at the New York Times were reporting on it. And uh, so uh, I've known him for a while. And so we, we visited with him. And I, I was just wondering, uh, and that's, this is a painting of him and his partner. Um, I'm wondering, as a gay man, uh, Dan, how you experienced that visit to his home in New York City. And uh, I recall this trip, the first part of it that we were, on, were talking about was in 2011, before uh, President Trump was elected. And I remember something that uh, Dr. Mass said to us. There's that famous saying by Santayana, those who don't learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them, Mass said. I've credited, I, I'm reading from our, our book. I have created an addendum to that. They will repeat them even if they've learned history as long as they think they can get away with it. History can turn on a dime, Mass mused. He insisted a Hitler-style demagogue could foment public targeting of African Americans, Muslim Americans, or gays. Quote, it doesn't have to be Jews, Mass said. When the public starts going crazy, when the public starts getting that fever of bondedness, about something, rationality drops away, and the mass psychology of fascism takes over. Mass's description of inhuman human behavior recalled Twain's maxim that man is the only animal that blushes or needs to. Uh, Dan, any thoughts about our visit? I can't hear you. I, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. I was uh, I was muted. Um, I think reflecting now on on our trip from from nine years ago, um, Mass's words were were very almost prophetic. You know, um, I remember thinking about the interview we had with him during the Charlottesville protests and sort of you know these these sentiments that he expressed to us all these years ago kind of came true in a way in a, in a very frightening manner. Um, as a 
as a gay man, I, I guess I enjoy a lot of privileges in terms of all of the groundwork that the older generation of the LGBT community paved for, for us. So I, I remember being struck by um, Mass's sort of dismay at the, you know, current young generation and their kind of cavalier attitude towards HIV AIDS. You know, Mass was one of the co-founders of the gay men's health crisis in New York City back in 1982. So he had seen really firsthand the devastation that the disease wrought on the community. Um, and so, so it, you know, it was such an honor to, to meet someone that played such a fundamental role in making sure that, you know, my generation and the ones that come after that we enjoy kind of these privileges. So it was, it was, uh, it, it was eye-opening really. Thanks, Dan. So um, in uh, Hartford, we visited uh, Ingrid Madsen. I just want to introduce her by saying, many Americans viewed Muslims' religion, Islam, as an anti-Christian faith, fraudulent, destructive, and evil. In Innocence Abroad, a young, ignorant Mark Twain portrayed Muslim leaders as bloodthirsty savages on a par with American Indians, whom Twain also denounced as subhuman. He wrote, Muslims' natural instincts do not permit them to be moral. That perception of Muslims and of Islam was reinforced by the coordinated terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Dan and Alyssa and I talked about this with Ingrid Matson, whom the New York Times labeled perhaps the most noticed figure among American Muslim women. She directed Hartford Seminary's McDonald Center for the Study of Islam and Christian Muslim Relations. She also was the first woman uh, the first non-immigrant and the first Muslim convert to head the Islamic Society of North America. She grew up Roman Catholic and attended a Catholic girls' high school, but she stopped going to mass at 16. A precocious unbeliever I was and identified as an agnostic. Impressed by the dignity and generosity of spirit of West African Muslims she met while studying in Paris, she started reading the Quran, converted to Islam and earned a PhD in Islamic studies. She stressed the importance of treating Muslims as individuals and recognizing that Islam is not anti-Western or anti-modernity. The mass vast majority of America's five to eight million Muslims, a quarter of whom are African Americans, integrated themselves into US culture. Some adopted anglicized names, married non-Muslims and thoroughly assimilated. Others proudly held on to distinctive Muslim names, dress and traditions, still pursuing the American dream. They saw the United States by and large as a multicultural democracy that while often flawed, valued law and liberty, including religious freedom. She struck me as a modern Muslim woman who was as progressive as a Muslim woman can be and still show respect for traditional aspects of Islam's culture. She sided with the majority of Muslims who felt that the Iman, the officiating priest of a mosque, should be a male if called on to lead prayer for a congregation of women and men. She wore a headscarf and covered all but her hands and face, which she viewed as an act of equality and empowerment that helped free her from being judged on her appearance. But she kept her surname when she married. She mowed the family's lawn while her husband served as primary family cook. She shared equally with her husband in raising their two children. American Muslims, Matson said, have had an unfair burden placed on them since 9-11. They are expected to eradicate radical Muslim terrorists and their sympathizers. We would love to, but we are not in control of those people, Matson said to us. These horrible people are terrorizing everyone. More Muslims have been killed by ISIS than non-Muslims. Muslims are like other people in that we have our good guys and our bad guys. Don't judge Muslim people by the worst of them. Dan, do you recall your reaction to uh, Ingrid Matson? Um, yeah, I'm a little embarrassed to I guess I'd admit it, but um, I guess I, I came into the interview with some unconscious bias about um, you know what a Muslim woman could be, really, and and I kind of kind of talk it up a little bit to post 9/11 Islamophobia that was really rampant in our country. Um, you know, I was I guess I was taken aback by the fact that Matson was so you know um, forthcoming, mirthful, just engaging, charismatic, all of these things that I, I guess I had never seen. Just, just for lack of exposure, really. So it was a learning moment for me um, to meet Ingrid. 
Thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan, you uh, you had a couple of incredible interviews, and uh, I thought you might uh, uh, talk about Giuseppe Anthony Tran and and uh, and Troy Williams. Yeah, sure. Um, so here's a this is a Vietnamese man that we interviewed in New Orleans. Um, in New Orleans, the Vietnamese community commemorated the four decades since the end of the Vietnam War a little differently. Everywhere else, they were mourning, Giuseppe Anthony Tran said. Here, we celebrated four years of success, evaluating ourselves and seeing what we've done. Tran was born in 1964 to a family of rice farmers in Hatien, a beach town at the southernmost tip of Vietnam. During his childhood, an unexploded shell jutted out from the ground right in front of his house. Every day, the little boy, then known as Tuan, Vietnamese for safe and secure, would touch the shell with wonder. Like a Vietnamese Huckleberry Finn, Tran, when he was 16, decided to flee the country on a raft with 11 other young Vietnamese, total strangers and most of them teenagers. My mom saved a lot to put me on board, Tran said. I would say the equivalent to $400. That's a lot in Vietnam in the 80s. He was the youngest of seven siblings, just two years shy of military age. He'd either leave the country then or never have the chance. Living under the communists, you get the feeling that you don't have another day to live, he said. Everything is controlled. That's why I told my parents, I don't see any future here. He left on the night of April 30th, 1981, while the communists were celebrating six years since the, since the end of the war. It was everyone's first time at sea. No one knew how to properly maneuver the raft. They had no compass, no map. By night, they faced heavy storms. By day, the sun fried their skin into rice paper, Tran recalled. Eventually, and miraculously, they landed at the border between Malaysia and Thailand. Although it was a poor village in the province of Naratiwat, at least it was in Vietnam. Once word spread that a group of Vietnamese refugees had arrived in the village, the government of Thailand took them in, placing the group in the Songkla refugee camp. Tran started making plans with his older brother to come to the United States. His brother Dung, however, was a priest, wasn't allowed to take in another person. So his brother asked an Italian-American couple he knew through Catholic charities to co-sponsor Tran. Francisco and Evelyn Giovanni, who lived in Chicago, took Tran in, named him Giuseppe Anthony, put him through high school and college. That's why I'm in love with Italy, Tran said, an Italian Vietnamese living in America. Eventually, Tran settled in the Village de l'Est neighborhood in New Orleans, a neighborhood known for its Vietnamese community. The river there is crowded with lily pads. Many of the men are shrimpers by trade. In Village de l'Est, there's a distinct feeling of Quê Hu, or homeland. The feeling, is, the feeling of unity is there, Tran said, and it's lovely. He had been to other Vietnamese communities in Texas and California, but nothing compared to Village de l'Est in New Orleans. For the Vietnamese community, which had so often experienced exodus and relocation from North to South Vietnam, from Vietnam to refugee camps, and from those camps to America and elsewhere, the devastation wrought by Katrina in 2005 was yet another experience of moving from one place to another. During the hurricane, it took Tran 28 hours to reach Dallas from New Orleans, usually an eight hour trip. As Tran told it, two weeks after the storm, the displaced Vietnamese came right back and fixed their homes. We shoveled out the mud, picked up, cleaned up, came back strong. Tran now serves as the parish coordinator of the Mary Queen of Vietnam Church. Over a meal of Vietnamese food at Bat Mien restaurant, Tran told me, with my life, I feel I had more than I wished for. Looking back on the journey, everything was a blessing all along. Thanks, Dan. Um, that, re that reminds me, before you go talk about uh, Troy Williams, um, we visited Louisiana State Penitentiary, which uh, is it's on the Mississippi River. Uh, it's as large, it's even larger than Manhattan. Uh, about 6,000 inmates, 80% African-American. And uh, the warden insisted that everybody, they, they were either labeled black or white. So we uh, asked to interview people who are not either black or white. Uh, and uh, we had trouble getting approval. Uh, finally, the, uh, the Louisiana ACLU helped us get interviews with some Native Americans and uh, Dan, and and uh, Dan managed to uh, talk with uh, a Vietnamese American, um, and I just thought it might be interesting uh, his experience because he spoke to him in Vietnamese, and I'm I'm curious as to how that went. Yeah, sure. Um, 
this was the second maximum security prison, prison visit on our trip. The first being um, Amira Correctional Facility in upstate New York. Um, I remember when I met Hao Nguyen, whose nickname was Hop Singh in, in the prison, he was serving a life sentence. It was almost a, a looking glass uh, moment for me. He looked so much like my uncles, you know, back in back in Salt Lake. And um, I remember him telling me when we were when we were chatting that he hadn't spoken Vietnamese in in years. Um, so I, I don't know. This this kind of shook me to the core. After after we left uh, Angola, I thought about how a lot and um, really reflected on you know this kind of stereotype um, of Asians in America, uh, of the Vietnamese community uh, also, of, of tiger moms and overachievers. And, and while it's definitely true to some extent, um, meeting how Nguyen really underscored for me that, that this, this sort of model minority myth really kind of erases um, the real struggles and, and problems that are you know, happening in the Asian community. Um, and, and yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I wrote him a letter uh, a few years later. I never got a reply, but, um, but I think about our meeting um, often. Thanks, Dan. He may have not gotten a reply because actually I tried to track him down to get permission to use his photo. And to do that, uh, I, I learned that uh, he was taken to another prison and they, they forwarded the letter. So it worked out in the end, but... Uh, now that may have been the problem. So uh, you returned home to you, you Salt Lake City, and we had some really interesting interviews there. I interviewed an African American Mormon woman, uh, and she talked about the experience of being black in the Mormon Church. And you interviewed Troy, Troy Williams. Yeah. Um, here's another excerpt um, from, from the book. In 2008, the Mormon Church in Utah publicly supported Proposition 8 in California. It was a constitutional amendment that would ban same-sex marriage. One year later, in July 2009, a gay couple was arrested after one kissed the other on the cheek near the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City, my hometown. Troy Williams, who I knew from my time working at the community radio station, KRCL, was outraged when he heard the news. Williams was at that point the executive producer and co-host of Radioactive, a talk show centered on grassroots activism. He's also been referred to as the gay mayor of Salt Lake City by the Salt Lake Tribune. So inspired by the sit-ins of the civil rights era, Williams organized three so-called kiss-ins at the exact plaza where the gay couple was handcuffed. The rallies he led, attended by both gay and straight couples, lips locked in protest, were aimed at calling out the Mormon church and a religion that he was once a part of. Williams said LGBT activism in Utah could be a model for other marginalized groups in the US. If you go to large urban centers of queer people, you see lots of divisions, Williams said. Here in Utah, we don't have the kind of luxury to have those divisions. We just don't. Williams said that the recent spotlight on Mormonism, a Broadway musical, a GOP presidential candidate in Mitt Romney, has put pressure on the Mormon church to reevaluate its position on homosexuality. He cites the fact that until 1978, Mormon African-American men were denied the right to hold the priesthood. Under pressure from non-Mormons in the US, church leadership allegedly received a revelation from God that allowed the Mormons to change their position. If the church is to survive, Williams said, it's going to have to wake up in a big way. It's going to have to draw down the powers of heaven and actually come up with a revelation. Otherwise, this rising generation is going to say, not interested. For all the differences the Mormons have with the LGBT community and vice versa, Williams said the two groups have a lot more in common than people would believe. Mormons and queer people know what it's like to be hated for being different, Williams said, so they ought to have empathy. The Mormons were radical communitarians who practiced a different marital form, polygamy. They fled the US in the mid 1800s and settled in the Salt Lake Valley ensconced in the Rocky Mountains and flanked by desert. When the Utah Territory was incorporated in the United States in 1896, the Mormons felt a tremendous need to assimilate and prove that they were just regular Americans. Williams said the marginalized and persecuted groups tend to show they've become good and worthy Americans by finding another group and ostracizing them. They forget their own history of oppression and start to contribute to the oppression of others, Williams said. That's what the Latter-day Saints have done. Since our interview with Williams, he 
He's gone on to become the executive director of Equality Utah, an LGBT active, uh, advocacy organization. A long awaited hate crimes law was passed in 2019 in Utah and gay conversion therapy was banned in the state in January of this year. Thanks, Dan. Uh, well, this is a, uh, <laughs> a uh, slide of us. Uh, uh, when we got out west, we made sure to vi visit Virginia City, uh, where Twain had prospected and, uh, and became a reporter. And there was a, uh, so we thought in honor of Twain, we should uh, be very Western. And here we are as uh, barmaid and uh, bank robbers. Uh, so it wasn't all serious interviews. So, um, one of the things that I thought we, uh, we experienced throughout the trip was a, a, a sense of how ignorant we were about Native Americans. We stopped at the Kickapoo Reservation in Kansas uh, for a day and a half. And uh, then when we got to California, uh, I managed to go to uh, the uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, the, the oldest uh, mission in San Francisco, Mission Dolores, which was founded by Spanish priests in 1776. Uh, and um, I, I was really taken by the message of this assistant curator, Vincent Medina. Uh, and he talked about, he's only 27, but he's very active in uh, his uh, tribe. And uh, he said that almost 6,000 Native Americans constituted the largest group buried at the mission. Uh, and he was, he was very tough on the Spanish priest. He said uh, uh, Spanish priests such as uh, Juniper Sara, uh, founder of the Ca California missions, who was given sainthood by Pope Francis in 2015, saw the missions as utopian Christian communities to help the Indians and save their souls. In reality, the missions were, Medina said, horrible places similar to concentration camps. Once baptized, Indians were held against their will. They were treated as slaves, their land taken, their labor exploited, a detachment of soldiers shackled and whipped those who tried to flee. Unmarried Indian women were forced to work as spinners and weavers when they were not being driven into the mission for mass or lessons in church doctrine. By 1843, the mission's total Indian population of at least 1,000 had been reduced to eight aged starvelings. That experience drove Medina to work at Mission Dolores, where he offered an Indian perspective on the history of the mission. Medina also committed to a larger challenge to change the way the story of the missions was told and taught throughout California in a required fourth grade unit on the missions. Some mission curators resisted, but he helped this California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center develop a website about Indian opposition to the mission. He worked at Heyday, the publisher of books about California Indians, as an outreach coordinator. He is determined, he said, to make concrete change happen. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, we had uh, some wonderful interviews, but one evening, our parked van fell victim to smash and grabbers. They escaped with our video cameras, two laptop computers, and Melissa's two suitcases. The loss of irreplaceable video interviews and photos hit us hard. The story got better the next morning. Someone named Kimberly Kills tweeted Alyssa and asked where she was. Alyssa replied San Francisco and learned that Kills had found one of her suitcases after midnight on a sidewalk in Oakland, about 10 miles from San Francisco. In arranging for us to meet Kills at a Starbucks in Oakland to pick up her bag, Alyssa said, I think she's a porn star. Alyssa appeared to be right. KimKills.com called Kills, quote, one of the hottest natural transsexual porn stars on this planet, unquote. Kills described herself as a 28-year-old uh, transgender male to female uh, actor. At any rate, we wound up going to uh, the Starbucks in Oakland and retrieving uh, Alyssa's bag. And here they are pictured together. Um, she was, uh, she, she, she almost looks like a sister. Certainly she was a sister of kindness to us. I, I also wanted to, uh, um, we've been talking a lot about immigrants. And um, when we got to Seattle, where uh, Twain left for his uh, around the world trip to uh, get solvent again, 
Um, I, of course, uh, was interested in if there were Gilionis. Well, there, there were some. And um, uh, it brought back uh, stories about my great grandfather, Angelo Francesco Gilioni, pictured here. And um, uh, he was an, the, entre the, the uh, a typical entrepreneur, immigrant entrepreneur, working very hard. But the family uh, was really run by his wife, Maria Strada Gilioni. And because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to say a few things about her. Um, she, uh, she made everybody attend Sunday dinner. Even when family dinners were held at her son's homes in Seattle, she dictated what was to be served. She hung on to the old world. Her Ligurian dialect was incomprehensible to a grandchild who had learned Italian. Those who disobeyed Maria were called in translation turnip heads or idiot. Maria's superstitions ruled. We couldn't have 13 at the dinner table, and we always had 13 in the family, Mabel Lucas, her granddaughter, said. She didn't want a handkerchief as a gift. A handkerchief meant crying or sharp things because they would cut a friendship. She saw perfection in everything. Uh, if uh, when she visited a children's home, upon sitting down to eat, she would pick up the plate and rub her finger across it to make sure there was no grease on it. She insisted on the freshest of vegetables and fruits from her garden, everything planted by the moon or from Seattle's Pike Street Market, which was founded by an Italian immigrant. She ordered the Pike Street Market vendors to give her the best or else. Um, she had a, tr a trinity of traditional values, honor, cleanliness, thrift, and uh, when she uh, went once, when her husband came home with uh, uh, $5, not every cent of his pay, and said, I bought a few rounds for the boys at work. She exploded, okay, if you're going to drink it up, I'm going to burn it up. And she screamed, tossing the $5 bill in a parlor stove. As much as I admire the entrepreneurial spirit of my great-grandfather and the uh, values of my great-grandmother, I was taken by um, their son, Dr. August Gilioni, for a couple of reasons. Uh, here he is uh, in the center um, as the surgeon, chief surgeon at uh, Providence Hospital, the largest uh, private hospital in Seattle. Um, he was also uh, counsel to the Italian community in the, in the region in, in the Pacific Northwest. When the Black Hand, a criminal syndicate formed by Italian immigrants, tried to extort money from other Italian immigrants, Dr. Gilioni aided police in breaking up the plot. For a time, he traveled with a bodyguard and carried a gun in his car. One night, he put his Pope Hartford in his garage. He and his wife and their two children retired for the evening. Shortly after, the midnight, after midnight, the garage exploded. The Seattle Daily Times carried front page photos. The headline shouted, dynamite outrage perpetrated against Italian consular agent Gilioni. Under the headline of the shame of Seattle, the post intelligencer editorialized about the corrupt police, the partnership between the police chief and criminal classes, and the chief's unwillingness to protect Dr. Gilioni and his family. When Dr. Gilioni wasn't dealing with corrupt police, he helped meet the medical needs of impoverished Italian Americans. His, his patients were primarily truck gardeners and laborers from Southern and Central Italy who lived in neighborhoods with nicknames like Garlic Gulch. He spoke their Italian dialects, wrote prescriptions in English or Italian, and conveniently forgot to charge patients who lacked the money to pay. What impressed me most, I think, is that um, as a, the Italian council, he defended uh, immigrants against uh, criticism in Seattle. When a Seattle Times reader disparaged Italian, Chinese, and Japanese immigrants in 1910, Dr. Gilioni attacked the reader's ignorance and misinformation. He defended immigrants' patriotism and dismissed the reader's call for immigration restriction as amounting to, quote, air bubbles. In response to the reader's claim that Italians were violent criminals, Dr. Gilioni cited a study of Italians in America that concluded, generally speaking, they are gentle drudges, honest, faithful, and inoffensive. He foresaw an America enriched and enlivened for generations to come, 
by its immigrants, by people of different races, ethnicities, religions, and visions of what life in the United States could be. Perhaps this is a good place to stop. I can't help but note by contrast the Trump administration's pursuit of the destruction of immigration in America. And uh, I invite your questions about our odyssey or comments. Um, we, again, thank you for joining us tonight and we're really honored to be at the, the library, even if it's by Zoom. Well, thank you, and we're, we're thrilled that you're here and welcome back. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and then I can read it to Dan and Lauren. Or if you would like to unmute yourself at this time and ask a question, that would be lovely. You can also type next into the chat function and then I'll know you would like to speak next if someone else is speaking. Um, well, uh, Gus, this is Gus. Thank you, Gus. Go ahead and ask your question. Please. Um, yes, uh, we're at the Mark Twain Library, so to speak, <laughs> and we're talking about Mark Twain and his travels. And um, I gather that um, he's not at all considered a racist, and he was uh, very much of an anti imperialist, also. Um, is there some uh, specific relevance to Mark Twain and his attitude to race that we could uh, discuss, or is that not relevant to, to this particular discussion? No, it's, it's highly relevant. Um, I think he's a complex figure when it comes to talking about race. Uh, he knew African-Americans uh, and his family, uh, as I think you know, had, uh, had a slave uh, coming in to uh, 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 where he was born in Missouri, Florida, Missouri. Um, but he, uh, he was not as comfortable, indeed he was very critical of Native Americans and Muslims. Uh, and um, I, I think there he did not, he did not know people uh, that he was talking about. And it was a sort of offhand comments that he would make about Italians and the French one in Innocence Abroad, you know, witty, sarcastic comments. Um, I remember visiting, um, we, we, in New Haven, we visited uh, Yale Law School and um, when he visited, when Mark Twain visited Yale to speak uh, in the 1880s, he was taken around by an African-American student from the law school. And he was so impressed by him the student was, you know, having to work three jobs, uh, uh, collecting credit from students and waiting tables and, uh, and a variety of other jobs. And at any rate, uh, Twain quietly went to the dean of the law school and said, you know, we haven't treated uh, people of color uh, fairly. And so he paid for the education of the student without any recognition. Uh, I don't know that that much is known about that experience, but it impressed me. So, um, you know, I think there are scholars who say he never got away from uh, having a view that whites were superior to uh, um, black Americans. And I remember when he was interviewed in India on that round the world trip, he was asked about uh, uh, mixed race uh, marriage. And he said, uh, oh, that's impossible, absolutely not. Whereas uh, I think, as you know, that uh, you know, uh, we're moving toward a country where uh, mixed is more uh, common than, uh, than ever. So he's a really interesting figure on, on race, complex. Um, I think- Thank, I, I, thank I, you. Um, thanks for your question. I think I'll also just add a, a quote from Mark Twain that kind of adorned the t-shirts that we handed out to, to people along the way. Um, he said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Oh yeah, there you go. Here's the back. <laughs> so so we, we kind of, um, that kind of was the, the mantra of the trip in a way, you know, it was a way for all the three of us to kind of diminish our ignorance about identity issues in the US and, you know, clearly Twain did in his time as well. Yeah, I must say that, you know, I 
I am thrilled to have been part of your journey tonight to caught a little glimpse and to meet some of the marvelous Americans that you met along the way. I uh, wanna let everyone know that we can learn, meet even more of these people because your book is coming out on October 25th. And um, there is uh, one of our local bookstores, Books on the Commons in Ridgefield will um, order the books for us. If somebody would like to um, just either call them or send an email to them and they will order the book for you and have it here right around its release date. So, and they just asked us to do that before October 26, if we could put our orders in. So, but um, I think, so are there, thank you. There you can see the, the cover of the book. Any other questions out there? <laughs>